We present Peter Cook and Marjorie Westbury in Paul Temple and the Margot Mystery. The final episode, The Visitor. The only way for us to secure this evidence, Mr. Stone, is for someone to break into a certain house and search for it. I see. And I take it that's what you'd like me to do, Mr. Temple? Yes. And what is this piece of evidence, exactly? It's a diamond and ruby bracelet. It belongs to my wife. Your wife? Yes. Then the bracelet was stolen from you. Well, don't worry too much about the finer details of this assignment, Wally. Here's the address. If you don't find the bracelet, phone me. If you do, come straight back here. And what if anything goes wrong? Nothing must go wrong. That's important. However, if you do get into trouble, don't worry. I'll get you out of it. All right, Mr. Temple. Has your visitor gone? Mm, Yes, about ten minutes ago. Paul, you look worried. You've looked like this for the last two days. I am worried, Steve. I have a terrible feeling that this case might well turn out to be one of our failures. But why should you think that? I think the fence realises that the game is up and there's a very good chance that he might slip through our fingers. But surely... Yes, Charlie? Uh, Sir Graham Forbes is here, sir. Yeah, come in, Sir Graham. Hello, Steve. Hello, Sir Graham. I've been trying to get you on the phone all day. Yes, I know. I'm sorry, but I've been very busy, Temple. We've had a message through from Westerton. You know that woman that worked for Dr. Bincari? Mrs. Fletcher, yes. She has a son. That's right, Bill. He runs a garage. He was knocked down by a car early this morning. He's in Westerton Hospital. Oh, dear. Is he badly hurt? Yes, I'm afraid he is. And the car didn't stop. But the point is, Temple, the boy's asking for his mother, and we just don't know where she is. She's not at the garage. No, I don't expect she is, Sir Graham. I saw her this morning. She told me she was leaving for Australia. Australia? That's what I wanted to tell you, Sir Graham. Mrs. Fletcher told Steve that not only did she work for Dr. Ben Cardi, but that she... Oh, excuse me, Mary. Hello? Mr. Temple? Yes? Uh, Rain here. Is Sir Graham with you? Yes. Hold on, Superintendent. It's for you, Sir Graham. Thank you. Hello? Oh, Rain here, sir. What is it, Rain? We haven't located Mrs. Fletcher yet, sir, but we've discovered that she's got a BOAC booking for tonight. Flight BO-107 to Melbourne. What time does it leave? Uh, the takeoff is scheduled for 9.15. All right. Thank you, Rain. Did you hear that, Temple? Yes, I did. And I've got a suggestion to make, Sir Graham. What is it? Let Steve deal with Mrs. Fletcher. Good evening, Mrs. Fletcher. Oh, it's Mrs. Temple. That's right. Well, what do you want? Oh, that's my plane. I must go. Wait a minute, Mrs. Fletcher. I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you. I know what you're up to. It's a trick to try and stop me from... Bill has had a serious accident. He's in Western Hospital. I... I don't believe you. It's true, I assure you. What happened? He was knocked down by a car early this morning. The car didn't stop. Whether it was an accident or not, we don't know. How how bad is he? He's on the danger list. And he wants to see you. He keeps asking for you. If this isn't true... You can ring the hospital if you like. Western 824. No, 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 I believe you. You say the car didn't stop. That's right. A swine ought to have realised something like this would happen. Look, I've got my car outside. I'll run you straight down to Western. Thank you, Mrs Temple. What about my ticket? Don't worry. I'll see to that. I'll see to everything. Oh, sorry, Mr. Temple. I thought Anything I... wrong, Charlie? No, sir, but I heard a noise. I didn't know you were down here. Oh, I'm sorry if I disturbed you. Well, that's all right, Mr. Temple. It's two o'clock in the morning, you know. Yes, I know. Is Mrs. Temple still out? It's all right, Charlie. She had to go down to Westerton. Oh, Oh, I see. Well, would you like me to get you some coffee, Mr. Temple, while you're waiting for her? No, I'm all right. Just leave me, Charlie. I want to get on with this. Is that the front door? Yes, it must be Mrs. Temple. Paul? I'm in the study. Oh, Paul, you shouldn't have waited up. Good evening. Uh, Morning, Mrs. Temple. Well, how did you get on, Steve? Well, Mrs. Fletcher was a bit suspicious at first, but eventually she realised I was telling the truth. Ah, and what about Bill? 
He's had the operation, and he's still very ill, but they think he'll pull through. Oh, thank goodness. Mrs. Fletcher was so relieved when she heard he'd got over the operation that she's agreed to do everything you wanted. Really? She's staying the night at the hospital. I said we'd drive down there tomorrow. Good. What else did she say? Well, she's explained about the coat with the name Margot in it that was found in my car. Yes. It appears that just about that time, Mrs. Fletcher discovered that the gang were going in for drug smuggling. And she disapproved? Oh, of course she did. Mm. Particularly when she discovered that she'd been distributing drugs without realising it. Without realising it? Mm-hmm. You see, from time to time, they asked her to take certain coats down to Brighton. The coats were handed over to Margot, the fortune teller, who distributed the drugs. The drugs were concealed in the coats, then? Yes, in the buttons. Ah. Apparently, when an addict got into touch with Margot, they were handed one of the coats, and then, in order to get another supply of heroin, they had to return the empty coat. I see. Anyway, when they gave Mrs. Fletcher another coat to deliver, she decided she wouldn't, and that she'd tell them so. Larry Cross was just leaving for the airport when she tackled him about it. They argued all the way about it in the car, but finally Cross lost his temper and pushed her to one side and uh, concentrated on the matter in hand. Which was the kidnapping of you? Yes. Mm. Mrs. Fletcher tossed the coat into my car, caught the next bus back to town, and she thought that Cross would return to the car and pick up the coat. I see. Did she let you into any more of her secrets? And she admitted that she tipped us off about the fortune teller. And then blackmailed the woman into telling us about Breakwater House. Mm. You know, I can't help but think we owe a great deal to... Oh. Was that the front door bell? Yes. But are you expecting anyone? Yes, I am. Wally Stone. At this time of the night, mm-hmm. with the morning... There's a gent to see you, Mr Temple. He says you're expecting him. Ask him in, Charlie. In here, sir. Good morning, Mr. Temple. Ah, hello, Wally. You know my wife. Yes, good morning, Mr. Stone. Uh, Good morning, Mrs. Temple. Uh, Well, what happened? Well, I had to open the safe. A very neat little job it was, too, concealed in an alcove just behind the fireplace. It took a bit of finding. Was it much trouble to open? Uh, Tiresome, you know, a little tiresome. Uh And what was inside? Oh, loads of stuff. My goodness, yes. Had a bit of a job sorting out what I'd come for. Lucky you gave me a good description. Ah, there we are. That is the bracelet, isn't it, Mr. Temple? Yes, that's the one. But that's my bracelet. Yes, I know. But how on earth did Mr. Stone get hold of it? He's just told you. He stole it from the fence. Oh, yes, please, nurse. We have an appointment with a Mrs. Fletcher. My name is Temple. This is my wife. Oh, yes, Mr. Temple. She is expecting you. This way, please. Thank you. How is Mr. Fletcher this morning? He had a fairly good night. I think the doctor's quite pleased with him. Oh, good. In here, please. Some visitors for you, Mrs. Fletcher. Good morning, Mrs. Fletcher. Oh, good morning. I hear Bill's had a good night. Oh, yes. They seem quite pleased with him, in fact. Yes, good. The nurse has just been telling us. Mrs. Temple... I do apologise for my behaviour last night. Believe me, I'm most grateful. Oh, that's all right. When I think that if it wasn't for you, I'd be on the other side of the world this morning. I just don't... Now, don't worry about last night. (laughs) Mr Temple, what do you think will happen to me? You mean with the police? Yes. Well... You see, although I work for Dr Benkari, I didn't really know what was going on. I thought that... Well, the point is... Will the police believe me, or will they say ignorance is no excuse for what's happened? I don't know, Mrs Fletcher, but I'll certainly have a word with Sir Graham and make a point of telling him what you've done to help us. Thank you. But first of all, have you seen Dr Benkari or spoken to her since last night? Yes, I have. I I did just as Mrs Temple asked Uh me. Tell me exactly what happened. Well, soon after breakfast, I asked the matron if I could use the telephone in her office. Is that Mr. Cross? Yes, speaking. Who's that? This is Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher? I thought you'd gone abroad. Well, I'll change my mind. Well, if you take my tip, you'll change it again and get the blazes out of here. I want to see Dr. Benkari. What's all this about, Fletcher? It's about some letters I have and some tape recordings. Dr. Benkari knows all about them. They're in a deed box at the bank. Tell the doctor if she'll meet me, I'm now prepared to do a deal. All right. I'm at the hospital at Westerton. 
I think you know why. I'll meet you both outside the hospital in about an hour. We can talk in your car. Uh, yes. All right, Fletcher. Now, pull yourself together, Mrs. Fletcher, and let's try to be sensible. If I'd really known what was going on, Dr. Bencari. I'd never have let you talk me into it. For weeks and weeks I've been trying to get away. You're too involved, Fletcher. You've got to take your chance with the rest of us. You didn't object to the money. I would have if I'd known what it was all about. Don't be a hypocrite. You knew all right. Very pleased. I kept telling you that Bill knew nothing about all this, yet you ran him down like that in cold blood. I assure you we know nothing about that accident, nothing whatever trouble is, I can't believe you anymore. I can only repeat that the accident had nothing to do with me. Now then, what's all this about letters and tape recordings? You mentioned this to me once before. What are they exactly? You know what they are. They're photostat copies of letters you received and tape recordings of telephone conversations. I took them while I was working for you. Why, you went up Shut up, Larry! When I found out what was going on, I had to protect myself. Especially after Ted Angus was murdered. I always had a soft spot for Ted. And what exactly did you plan to do with these letters? I was going to hand them over to the police if there was ever any attempt on my life or Bill's. I assure you no one is going to make any attempt on your life. How can I be sure of that? Look what happened to my Mrs. Fletcher, will you please listen to me? You must realize that you can't leave that box at the bank without taking some precautions. What's to prevent your son opening it any time? Don't you see it would get a lot of people into serious trouble, yourself included? It's a safeguard. It is not. And you must be made to realize that. If your son took that box to the police and they found out who murdered Ted Angus and Julia Kelburn... I had nothing to do with those murders. I know you didn't. But someone did. And if you value your son's life, you'd better hand that deed box over straight away. I'm prepared to hand it over. But not to you. Well, who are you prepared to hand it over to? The fence... But you don't know the fence. You've never met him, so why I know that, but I'm not prepared to hand it over to anyone else. And I'm only prepared to hand it over to him on one condition. Well? He's got to give a definite assurance that he'll leave Bill alone in the future. I think he'll agree to that, Mrs. Fletcher. Get the box from the bank and take it to your garage. You'll have a visitor this evening. About... Eleven o'clock. All right, Doctor. Eleven o'clock. Well, after that, I left Dr. Benkari and came back into the hospital. I hope I did the right thing, Mr. Temple. You certainly did, Mrs. Fletcher. I'm very grateful to you. But now I'm afraid I've got to ask you to do something else. Well, I'll do anything you ask. I'd like you to go through with this, Mrs. Fletcher. Get the deed box from the bank and take it to the garage. I'd like you to be there tonight when the fence arrives. It's, it's quite a risk. He's a desperate man and he's in a tight spot, but if that's what you want, I'll be there. Thank you. Now, this is what I want you to do. How many cars have we got, Rain? Four, apart from us, Sir Graham. There are two near the wood, one on the corner by the gate over there, and another one on the main road. When our visitor arrives, I think one of the cars had better block the entrance to the garage, Superintendent. Yes, I had that in mind. Mr Temple, who exactly are you expecting to see this evening? Dr Ben Carey? No. I think she's the prime mover so far as the drug smuggling is concerned, but I don't think she's the fence. No, neither do I. I believe she persuaded the fence to handle drugs, and he's regretted it ever since. There's a car coming. It's probably one of the locals on the way home from the pub. Well, if it is, that pub wants investigating. It's half past eleven. He's put his lights out. Yes, he's turning into the garage. He stopped. There he is. I can't see who it is. He's got his coat collar turned up. He's going down the passage at the side of the garage. This is our man, all right. Is Mrs. Fletcher armed? Yes, I gave her an automatic, but she won't use it except in an emergency. How long are we going to give him, sir? Four minutes, five at the outside. Check your watch, Rain. 
There's the sergeant. He's pulling up in front of the entrance. Good. We'll give him another four minutes and then move in. Right. I hope she's all right, Sir Graham. I feel responsible for her. If anything happens to Mrs. Fletcher, I'll, I'll never forgive myself. There he is. He's coming out of the house. Where? Over there, near the petrol Yes, box. you're right. He's got the deed box. I think he spotted us. Give the signal, Rain. Lights! He's running for it. He's coming this way. Temple, look out. He's got a revolver. Get down! He's dropped the gun. Careful, Temple. Temple's got him. Quickly, Sir Graham. Let go, let go. Temple, I warned you. It's no good, Langdon. It's all over. Wait, the no. police are here. I warned you, Temple. You're all right. You've asked for it. Oh. Temple, are you all right? Yes. Do you know, I'm getting a little old for this sort of thing. Well, I don't know about that, Mr. Temple. You've made a nice mess of Langdon. Yes. By Timothy, I have. She'll be sailing in about 15 minutes. Don't you want to go on deck? Not particularly. This is a change for you, isn't it, George? No last-minute instructions to anyone? No attempt to... What are you staring at? I was just looking out of the porthole, that's all. Linda, this is supposed to be a pleasure cruise. Let's not try to get on each other's nerves. <sighs> there aren't enough hangers for my dresses. All right, ring for the steward. Or better still, go and have a word with the purser. You'd better get to know him anyway. Let the poor devil know what he's in for. Well, if I see the purser, I shall complain about the accommodation. This bathroom's absurd. All right, do that. See where it gets you. Don't leave the cabin till I get back. That you can depend on, Linda. Oh, perhaps you'd be kind enough to pass me that carafe of water. Thank you. Now I'm going to see that purser. Good afternoon, Calvin. I thought you weren't taking your trip until the end of the month. I changed my mind. A sudden decision? Yes, Temple, a sudden decision. Well, where are the police? I saw them through the porthole. They're talking to your wife. You picked up Langdon, I suppose? He did. Also Dr. Ben Kari and Larry Cross. Langdon talked? He had to. Otherwise, the police might have believed he was the fence instead of you. He was most anxious that they shouldn't think that, Mr. Calvin. Still, we've got enough evidence against you without Langdon. I suppose you mean Mrs. Fletcher and the deed box. Yes, and the fact that my wife's bracelet turned up at your house. Your wife? So that was it. You were the burglar. By proxy. You know, I should have been on to you earlier, Kelvin. I should have realized what Tony Wyman meant when he said, Kelvin, the fence. He wasn't warning you against the electric fence. He was warning me against you. And that young fool overreached himself. He thought he knew all the answers, Temple. Just like you do. But you don't know all the... What is it, Kelvin? Uh, I took something just before you came in. I didn't intend the police to get Kelvin, me. you fool. Oh. You fool. Kelvin! Mr. Temple, we've taken Miss... Why, what is it? What's happened to Kelvin? He's dead. Would you like another brandy, Sir Graham? No, thank you, Steve. What about you, Superintendent? Well, I think I've had... just a little one. Oh, I thank you. Well, Temple, I noticed you studiously refrained from talking shop all through dinner, <laughs> in spite of the fact that Rain and I have been patiently waiting for the full background to the Margot case. Yes, there are quite a few things to be explained. Well, as we now know, the fence was George Kelvin. Yes, but what puzzles me is why a man in his position should turn to crime. Well, you have to admit the idea of a big-time fence operating on an international scale is a tempting one. Mm -hmm. A man like that could become extremely powerful, and there's no doubt that Kelvin was obsessed with power. Mm -hmm. I agree that's a fair estimate of the general picture. Uh, now, let's get down to details. 
Who exactly was in this organisation? Mike Langdon, Dr Ben Carey and Larry Cross were his chief lieutenants. And there were several smaller fry like Ted Angus, Oscar at the pet shop, Mrs Fletcher and Julia Kelvin. His own daughter? Yes, that's why he resented her friendship with Tony Wyman. But why did he? He thought that Wyman might find out she was working for the fence, which is exactly what happened, of course. Wyman tried to get in on the easy money and found himself out of his depth. But surely Kelvin's trouble started when he allowed Ben Carter to persuade him that the biggest money lay in smuggling drugs. Yes, that's true, Steve. His own daughter became an addict. That was terrible. Langdon had been against the drug activities right from the start and Kelvin turned to him to try and get Julia out of the habit. But by this time, Ben Carter had realised that Julia was Kelvin's weak spot. You think Ben Carey wanted to gain control of the organisation, then? Mm, Everything points that way. Naturally, Kelvin fought like a tiger. He built up an organisation and he resented anybody trying to take over. Yes. At first, it wasn't open opposition. In fact, he gave them a bigger cut in the profits to keep them quiet. I take it Larry Cross was on Ben Carey's side. Mm, Naturally. However, one condition of the extra cut was that the doctor should stop supplying Julia with drugs. This drove Julia frantic. She went down to Westerton to see the doctor, and on her father's instructions, Mike Langdon went to fetch her back. He had a lot of trouble with the girl, and she threatened to tell all she knew. This frightened Langdon, especially when he discovered she'd already told quite a lot to Tony Wyman. So he challenged her, and she was so defiant that he lost his temper and strangled her. Mm. And Wyman, of course, was the suspect. Mm, Kelvin thought of that. You remember what Tony Wyman said, Sir Graham, just before he died? He tried to tip you off about Kelvin being the fence. Mm, And unfortunately, I misinterpreted him. Yes, but what was he doing at Breakwater House? He'd been tricked into going there, just as Steve and I were, by that message from Fiona Scott. Oh, by the way, did you get her? Oh, yes. Yes. Wyman had been told to meet Kelvin at Breakwater House at the same time that Steve and I were due there. He was caught by the gang and tied up, and he overheard them talking about the steel rope and the electric fence. The rope was to have got rid of us... The fire was to have put paid to Wyman. Yes. Then what about the murder of Ted Angus? Uh, Angus was ordered to murder Tony Wyman. When he failed, he was told to report to Dr Ben Carey and was himself murdered by Larry Cross. What a dreadful night that was. I shall never forget finding him in that wood. No. And what did Angus mean when he told you to ask Mrs Fletcher about the coat? It was the coat worn by Julia Kelvin. This coat had the name Margot in it. Julia stole it and made arrangements to go to Brighton to see the fortune teller. To try and get another coat with a supply of heroin in it. Exactly. Well, we know what happened. Yes. Temple, do you think Langdon wanted to be top dog? Do you think he had any design on Kelvin's position? No, I don't think so, but of course Ben Carey obviously had. Langdon was a typical executive, not a leader. Kelvin depended on him for the unpleasant jobs. Then that nonsense about having you watch Linda Kelvin was a a deliberate attempt to take you away from the main issue. No, not entirely, Steve. Langdon knew that Linda had been seeing Larry Cross and Kelvin was afraid she would tell Cross about his contacts and methods of working. Kelvin kept things to himself as much as possible. That's what Ben Carey resented. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, it seems to me it'll take a couple of years to straighten out Kelvin's affairs. Legitimate and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Though just at the moment I'm more concerned with some of the smaller fry... Mrs. Fletcher, for instance. You know she saved our lives, Superintendent, and she's been most cooperative this past week or two. Yes, I know. I'm relying on you and Sir Graham to see she's let down lightly. All right, Temple. I'll have a talk with the public prosecutor. Oh, by the way, I hear her son is off the danger list. Yes, I think he'll be all right now. Larry Cross denied running him down. Oh, he's denied quite a lot of things that'll be brought home to him in the next week or so. Well, this has been quite a case, Temple. Quite a case. I should imagine you and Steve are ready for a pretty good holiday. Yes, and we're going to take one, Sir Graham. We're flying off to Jamaica on Thursday. Darling, I didn't know that. (laughs) No, I know you didn't. But this is wonderful. How long are we going to be away? Oh, five weeks, six weeks, uh, ten weeks, perhaps. (laughs) Well, don't stay away too long. London isn't the same without the temples. Well said, Ray. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Don't worry, we'll be back. We'll be back, Sir Graham. By Timothy, I hope so. In Paul Temple and the Margot mystery, the part of Sir Graham Forbes... I don't think we'll get anywhere with this investigation until we find the motive. ...was played by James Thomason. Superintendent Rain... 
We've made inquiries about the coat, but we failed to find the owner or even the shop where it was bought. Was played by Simon Lack. Mrs Fletcher? I've got certain documents and tape recordings in a very safe place. Played by Joan Matheson. Tony Wyman? Tell Mr Kelvin he can keep his 5,000 knicker and that goes for his daughter too. By John Rollison. Linda Kelvin? George wants to get away from Sir Graham Forbes and all the rest of Scotland Yard. Played by June Turbin. Mike Langdon? I was at the cocktail party the movie people gave you, Mr. Temple. <laughs> Me and 200 others. Played by Tommy Duggan. Dr. Benkari? I only saw Julia three or four times. I tried to get her to talk, but always there was a barrier. By Mary Wimbush. Larry Cross? The superintendent seems to think there's some connection between the Ted Angus murder and the Kelburn affair. Played by Hugh Manning. Charlie? Mrs. Temple said, I'm going out, Charlie. But if Mr. Temple gets back before me, just say Edgar Northampton. By James Beatty. Steve? Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Fletcher, but I think you're making a great mistake in running away. Was played by Marjorie Westbury. Paul Temple? You know, you had me worried, Kelburn. I should have realised what Tony Wyman meant when he said, Kelburn, the fence. Played by Peter Cook. And finally, George Kelburn, alias the fence. He thought he knew all the answers, Temple. Just like you do. But you don't know it. Played by Julian Summers. Production for the BBC was by Martin C. Webster. Webster.